these niggas rattle, got these bitches so loose. Tell them on the tone while she blow on my flu. I got biggie dreams, give me, give me the loot. Don't put no ceiling on me, I'ma shoot through the roof. Every day I wake up, I'm tryna blow it out. This bitch is knocking weed, hitting while I move through the town. I discover what it's like to say fuck it. You can look me in my eyes and you know I'm up to something. Took a little minute, but I like who I'm becoming. Focused on getting mine, I swear that's all that's on my mind My niggas ain't no ushers, they gon' let that bitch burn Why you smoke so much? Because this life should have served Really flexible as hell, she do yoga at the gym Go ahead and grab your ankles, girl, let me see your bed Let me see just what you worth, how much I'ma spend Can't stop it till my heart, do shit, I'm here to the end These niggas thinking like some locals, but I'm thinking like a mogul You can hate me for a lot of shit, that all my ex been noble Time is money, niggas, so I'm staying up late No chlorine, but my eyes look like Republican States. Ain't no love lost, I just move how I move You can look me in my eyes and you know I'm up to something Ain't no fucking guess man, feel like Kyrie ain't no puppet Like the heavens need an angel just for studying Yeah, you know it's always a vibe when some real ones collide Gotta keep some people around who know how to survive Hustling like a nigga just arrived Around the clock a nigga losing sense of time I done been through some shit Yeah, I have been through some shit But I get through it for what it's worth Can't show no love if the respect don't come first Can't pay no mind Look me in my eyes and you know I'm up to something Ain't no love lost, I just move how I move What up, good people? Welcome back to another episode of Not For Debate. Uh, this is Devor. Hey, this is probably like what? Take two, maybe three. I'm um recording on a van, brand new recording software here. So like, this is like my second or third time recording this this pod. We're going to be recapping NFL Week Four. Hopefully everything is crisp and clear this go around because I'm to be honest with you, I'm getting tired of recording this. Usually we record these Sunday night after the after the Sunday night football game. And unfortunately, it didn't end up turn out to be that way because like it was it was a deep pod where we was like 45 minutes long and then you get the finished product and you have an audio issues issues uploading it to where it needs to go like we were just having problems all over the place so hopefully this go around things will be a whole lot better than what it is so i believe the last time we spoke was probably like probably last sunday after the last sunday night game um but you i promise you i will not disappoint with this episode again Hopefully the audio is fine and we have no issues moving forward. But um, NFL Week 4 recap, I believe we can just go ahead and just jump right into the Kansas City Chiefs at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, final score ends up being 41-31. to 31. And I got to say, the Kansas City Chiefs came out to play this game versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers literally had no answer for the Kansas City Chiefs offense, Patrick Mahomes went 23 for 37 for 249 yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. Uh, just the creativity, I got to say, by the by the Kansas City Chiefs, whether that be Andy Reid or Eric Bieniemy, but nine times out of ten, I, I believe it's Andy Reid. Um, the creativity of the offense is just is just phenomenal. Like, just I just want to break down a specific play. That was, they were on the goal line. I believe it was probably before halftime, if I'm not mistaken. And Patrick Mahomes was in the shotgun and he was signaling to the left side to Travis Kelsey and everybody's keying in on Travis Kelsey. They're in the red zone. It's a, we gotta, we gotta put the spotlight on Travis Kelsey. Then another tight end is motioning and he ends up going under center and ends up doing a, a quarterback sneak type play where nobody knew that he was going to get the ball 
and they ended up scoring a touchdown. It was just a beautiful play design and just the attention that Travis Kelsey gets in the red zone. It just, it's, it's just, it's a t- attention to detail, I'll say, was just to perfection uh, on that particular play. But uh, let me know what you guys think about that play. But that, but I felt like that play was freaking phenomenal how they ended up uh, doing that. But it was also like, again, Patrick Mahomes was just amazing in this game. And I haven't been very, very high on Patrick Mahomes because like a lot of people when he first came, first came into the league and he was throwing touchdown pass and the touchdown pass. Like I was like, look, I got my, I'm a body at work. I, I got to see you do it on a consistent basis, but it literally looks like Patrick Mahomes is the real deal. And he is here to stay. It was another big play um, on the goal line too, as well in the first half. He ended up scrambling. He ended up getting, getting facing pressure on the left side. He ended up scrambling to the right, and he ended up making a making a Tampa Bay Buccaneers defender miss. And does a spin move, and then he ends up flipping the ball up over 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 a crowd of Tampa Bay Buccaneers defenders, and ends up getting it to Clyde Edwards Hilaire for an easy touchdown. But yeah, just the creativity of the Kansas City Chiefs, like what they're able to do. I know that particular play in general was more Patrick Mahomes more than anything, making a play, making something happen. But it was just it was just beautiful play design. And honestly, when you look at this game, just the the Kansas City Chiefs were just clicking on all, all cylinders. Like they 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 had a nasty taste in their mouth from the Super Bowl a couple of years ago, where they ended up getting blown out versus the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They were like this game. We're not having it. We're going to take care of business. Now, on the flip side, when you look at when you look at the the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they ended up having a slow start with a couple of couple of turnovers. Defensively, they had no answer for for Patrick Mahomes in that offense. Um, they just they just had a hard time getting things going, and it was looking like in the second half they was going to end up trying to make this thing a game again. But again, no answer for the Kansas City Chiefs. So the Kansas City Chiefs right now is sitting with a three and one right now in the AFC West and the Tampa Bay Buccaneers right now sitting at two and two in the NFC South. But again, one thing I did want to point out is the defense for the Kansas City Chiefs. Like they're they're starting to become a great complement to the Kansas City Chiefs. And in years past, the Kansas City Chiefs defense has always been has always been the weak link of the team. And now all of a sudden it's looking like they're they're finally gelling and it's become, they're becoming an excellent compliment. And I love it because that's what you need. That's what you want. The, the best teams that are, are, are complete where they're able to play great defense in their offense, especially their offense is extremely scary where they can put up where they can pull up 30 plus points at any at any given moment. Like and their defense is able to stop teams to hold them to twenty four points, twenty points. Like that is that that is all you can ask for. So look out for the Kansas City Chiefs. Like I already like we already knew that they were Super Bowl contenders, but they they could be a very very scary team if their defense continues to play on this level, uh, on this on this particular level where they're complementing their offense. Now. Going over some of these other games, I wanted to go, wanted to dial this thing back to the Thursday night game, the the Tua concussion protocol conspiracy thing going on. Now, third it was the Sunday game versus the Buffalo Bills. Tua ended up taking a big hit by a Buffalo Bills defender, and he ended up getting up a little bit wobbly. Now we spoke about this before last week where after he got helped up by his offensive lineman, the Dolphins offensive lineman, he stumbled forward and he like, it was made to seem like it was his, his ankle and his back. And honestly, I, I didn't think that was the case. A lot of people didn't think that was the case now, but when you, I, I broke this down before like when you, when you have issues with your back, like, Cause I get spasms all the time. Your your back buckles, like it, you like you straighten up, like you don't fall forward because it it it, it it's it, it it's tough to explain. I'm not a I'm not a doctor or anything, but it, like it's very very tough to explain. Like the way 
the way he just fell, like it just made it look like it was a concussion and and not a back injury and, and not an ankle injury. Now, he ended up stay, sitting out for about three plays, including halftime, came back after halftime and ended up winning. They end up winning the game versus the, the Buffalo Bills. Now let's go ahead and fast forward to the Thursday night game now. Now, I don't. It was one of the biggest issues for Tua in his career, is the fact that he doesn't get rid of the football. He always wants to make a play. In this particular situation, he was, I believe, it was a play action pass, and then he ended up trying to extend the play, and then he ended up getting slammed again on his on the back of, on his back and on the back of his head uh, versus the Cincinnati Bengals, and it was. Uh, it was very gruesome and graphic because at, at first I didn't realize it was a head injury. I thought like, did he break his, break his hand or something? Cause like his, his fingers like interlocked with each other. It was like a very, very weird thing. Never seen that before. And I was like, Oh my goodness. That's like, that's weird. Like I never seen something like that, like, but it was like, it was like very, very tough to watch. And I was just like, Ugh, I, I, I can't, I can't, but it, it was, from from the from Sunday, he was like they they had the had the investigation about as far as uh, was it really a concussion, and then now we really know now that it was actual concussion, and then there was questions about the fact that should he have played in this Thursday night game, which honestly I felt like he shouldn't have played. Now, honestly, when in the past with the concussion protocol, I thought that if you show like a, a little sign of a concussion. I'm thinking, I thought that you were not allowed to come back into the game and they were going to reevaluate it after the game. But clearly it did not seem to be the case with this whole Tua situation. Cause it clearly looked like he had a concussion. Like it, like you, you would have to be a fool for you not to think that that was a concussion. That wasn't a concussion, excuse me. So for him to turn around and come back out four days later or play another game, it's, it looks like it's, it looks very, very bad on the Miami Dolphins. If if we're being honest, like I'm pretty sure, like there's been multiple people, multiple people in that organization that have sat there and have, have and seen a concussion, and the public eye even knows it's a concussion, and you still throw them out there. Like I'm not out here putting put, throwing blame out to anybody, but again, like they already ha- held somebody accountable with the neurologist that was at the game for the Buffalo Bills that ended up getting. Getting, getting, getting. I believe he ended up getting fired, if I'm not mistaken. They didn't exactly disclose what his name was, uh, but I think again, this is a very, very bad look for the NFL in general. Because now, when you when you're a parent and you see and you sit down and you you watch this on national television, it was on a nationally staged game on Thursday Night Football, and you see Tua bounce his head off the off the ground like that and you see him just laying there it's like you really start to question like do you really do you really want your kids to go out there and play football sons to go out there and play football like i've already i've kind of already been on the fence about it myself my two boys because of the fact that i when i sit down and i watch the concussion movie it took me a while too like i believe it was like five years after it came out i was like this is not really something that I want my boys to be getting into because like your head, your head's not supposed to be hitting, hitting things at a certain, certain speeds. It's not supposed to be like that. So it, 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 it's very, very, very difficult as a parent for you to sit, go sit, that set ships and send your boys out there, excuse me, case talk, send your boys out there and have them do something like that on a regular basis. Unless they want to be a kicker. The kickers avoid contact. Defensive backs, for the most part, except for safeties, certain safeties. How about a corner? I guess I make my boys corners. They both be corners so they can avoid contact as much as possible. Uh, but yeah, it, it's de- it definitely was a good look for for parents to go out there, go and watch that on national television, and actually see the consequences of what could possibly happen to somebody if they are not properly treated for a a concussion. But uh, honestly, I feel like Tua should be done for the remainder of the season. 
I'm, I'm just being completely honest with you. I, I really think he should be done for the remainder of the season uh, because we want to make sure that everything is fine with him. Uh, it's a possibility, I would think, I forgot the amount of number of concussions that you could possibly have where you might want to consider a uh, retirement. Cause that was, that was, I believe that was some, some of the issues with a lot of former NFL players, why they just, just up and retired. Like they didn't exactly disclose why they retired, but they just retired out of the blue. So that could possibly be a conversation. Now, I wanted to go ahead and get into the game because of the fact that I feel like after the whole after the whole Tua situation, like it it really sucked the life out of the Dolphins as a team. Now, Teddy Bridgewater he ended up coming in after the injury. Uh, he went fourteen for twenty three for one hundred and ninety three yards, one touchdown, and one interception. Uh the Dolphins were were well in this game in the first half. And then I want to say what the turning point of the game was, was when Xavier Howard ended up going down. And this has been one of my biggest issues for the Miami Dolphins. When Brian Flores was the head coach and people call me a hater for this, but I'm just keeping it a hundred. Uh, the scheme that the Dolphins, they want to run is a, a lot of man blitzing. And that means when they blitz, their man, the their corners are left out on the island, man to man, and they have to hold their own until the pressure gets there, or they, or they, the defense, the defense ends up pressuring the quarterback into making a mistake, and it clearly, the Dolphins look like a totally different team without Xavier Howard and Byron Jones in the lineup. Now I don't know, the, I forgot the status of what Byron Jones was looking like as far as his return, but looking at Xavier Howard with the groin, uh, he wasn't exactly one hundred percent the last couple of weeks. Uh, Rashad Bateman ended up having a good day last week, but they but they ended up coming away with excuse me two weeks ago, and they end up coming away with a dub um, versus the Baltimore Ravens. But it's totally different defense, like and and I feel like the the Dolphins moving forward are going to be so dependent on the defense for them to be able to force turn takeaways, and that's then that's how they've been able to win football games over the past several weeks. Excuse me, the past three years. Excuse me. The past three years, them being able to generate turnovers and put their offense in wonderful positions for them to have easy, easy scoring possessions. And that's just, and that's, and honestly, without Xavier and without Byron, they're going to see a totally different Miami Dolphins defense where they're going to be coming out in a lot more zone and they're not going to be able to um, bring that exciting, exotic blitz that they've been able to do. But, um, We'll, we'll, we'll see what happens, but I want to get back to the Miami Dolphins offense again with Teddy Bridgewater. Uh, I want to see Te- Teddy Bridgewater with a full week of practice. Next week, they have the New York Jets, if I'm not mistaken. So it's going to be a pretty good test for Teddy Bridgewater. Um, how the offense is going to operate with Teddy Bridgewater under center. Are they going to... Are they going to take a, st- a, a, a step backward? Or are they going to continue to be successful? Um continue to be successful with their offense. Now, the one thing that I feel like is extremely underrated for the Miami Dolphins offense is the running game. Like they're ex- actually being able to get the running game going. And, and and it's actually setting up a lot of a lot of things. Now, Tyreek Hill and, and Jalen Waddle, like they're going to be very, very difficult to stop. Uh, no matter who the quarterback is, I feel like they should be able to get things get things done because of their ability to run after the catch. But again, uh, time will tell what what uh what this offense will look like with Teddy Bridgewater like I'm definitely going to be keyed into watching and seeing how that's going to end up going um uh moving forward uh for the Miami Dolphins but again I feel like Tua should sit out for the remainder of the season uh and then be reevaluated reevaluated after the season uh like how you want to how would you like to continue your career uh as being a quarterback for the Miami Dolphins, because this is a serious injury. Like this is a serious life threatening injury. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect you to make a decision right away, but that's something that you definitely want to think about uh, moving forward. All right. So the, the Sunday morning game between the Minnesota Vikings and the new Orleans saints, I think that it had everything that you could possibly ask for in a football game. 
if we're being honest with you. Like it was a close football game, but it was going back and forth. Um, the New Orleans Saints ended up making a fight back in the second half. Like everything you want to, that you want to ask for, and it was a national, it was an international game too as well. So we get the opportunity to send it to London. The L- people in London got an opportunity to watch it up close and personal. How the Americans get down. Uh, it's it, it was good, but I want to go ahead and just fast forward this thing uh, to the fourth quarter because I felt like that was just an action packed uh, fourth quarter for for both teams, well for the game in general. Now, in the fourth, the New Orleans Saints ended up scoring the touchdown at the beginning of the fourth quarter. Then the controversy comes here with the five, with five minutes and fourteen seconds left in the. In the fourth quarter with the Justin Jefferson was set up the Justin Jefferson touchdown. And that was a, it was a very, very controversial call where it came down to the whole pass interference situation where Kirk Cousins was going deep to Adam Thielen. Marshawn Lattimore was in coverage and it, they ended up calling a defensive pass interference uh, against Marshawn Lattimore, which again, it's controversial. Let me know what you think. But um, it looked from my from my perspective when I'm looking at when I'm looking at this particular play in general, like you clearly see that Adam, Adam Thielen is tugging on Marshawn Lattimore uh, out of position for him to get for Adam Thielen to get himself into better position for him to make a play on the ball. And obviously they called the pass interference on Marshawn Lattimore, which set up the. Minnesota Vikings at the three yard line where Justin Jefferson ended up scoring on a, on a, on a jet sweep, look, just walking into the end zone and they end up, they ended up uh, taking the lead. And then of course the new Orleans saints end up going down the field and scoring again on a field goal, end up kicking a 60 yard field goal with two minutes and 24 seconds left in the game. And the Minnesota Vikings go down again, they go down again, and they ended up kicking a 47-yard field goal, which has them take the lead next. Now, it was it was a miraculous ending, I got to say. It was a miraculous ending. We come down to the missed field goal, right? So, the missed field goal, the New Orleans Saints go right back down the field again, and they're setting up for a 61-yard field goal. Uh, Will Lutz, that's the kicker, kicks kicks the 61 yard. The ball bounces off the right upright, and then it bounces off the uh, what's that thing called? The crossbar. Excuse me, the crossbar. <laughs> it bounces right off the crossbar, and it, it ended up not going in. It go bounces right out. Like what an amazing finish! Like I said, it had this game had everything that you could possibly ask for. And like I wouldn't even mind watching it again, but I wanted to go ahead and point out Andy Dalton because Andy Dalton came in as the backup this game, and he didn't. Andy Dalton didn't play that bad. Andy Dalton literally came out twenty for twenty eight, two hundred and thirty six yards, one touchdown. Didn't put the team in harm's way. He did a fairly good job uh, in this game uh, for the New Orleans Saints, um, but it was it was a good game all the way around. I, I, I truly enjoyed this game. Uh, it was a great, great international game. It was definitely good, good for football to watch this game in London. Uh, some of the other games, um, the Cleveland Browns at the Atlanta Falcons. The Atlanta Falcons ended up taking it 23-20. to 20. Um, The controversial game. Oh. The, the Baltimore Ravens. I, 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 defensively, we have no idea what's going on with the Baltimore Ravens. They... They are just they are just struggling all the way around, right? So the Baltimore Ravens ended up taking a what was the score? They had a twenty twenty to three advantage advantage in the first half going into going into the third, and somehow they was again they gave up another big lead. Gave up another big lead to the ball to the Buffalo Bills. The Buffalo Bills scored seventeen unanswered points. Twenty, excuse me, twenty unanswered points. If we're being, if we're, if we're counting the field goal at the end. But I wanted to go ahead and just key in on the final drive for the Baltimore Ravens. 
the final drive with the, the final drive with the Baltimore Ravens, where they were put in a situation where they could have clearly walked away with a field goal, walked away with a field goal, and it's what is it? We're down. It's third and four. It's third and four at the Buffalo four yard line. And this is and 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 I'm going to get on Lamar about this. And a lot of folks that are Baltimore Ravens fans sit here and they listen to this pod all the time. And they be like, you're hard on Lamar. Let Lamar live like you got to know as far as game management is concerned. Like, you cannot afford to turn the ball over. You cannot afford to turn the ball over. The way that Lamar played, that ran this play was like it was off or nothing. It was fourth down. You had no other choice. And you had another down. You could have kicked your field goal. But anyway, so Lamar on third down and four on the Buffalo four-yard line, he scrambles to the right. Well, he does a whole bunch of things before that ends up back backpedaling a little bit, then scrambles to the right and then tries to get force the ball into the right, right side of the field and ends up getting picked off by Hamlin. Right. So again, this is third down. I'm thinking it's fourth down. It's all for nothing. That was a terrible play. It, 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 I'm just, I'm gonna go ahead and put it out there. You agree or not? It was a terrible play. You literally had another down where you could have made a decision. Are we going to go for it on fourth down, or are we going to go ahead and kick the field goal and take the lead? And uh, you and John Harbaugh can say whatever he wants. Like, the, the the what he said at the podium, like, I get it. You was trying to defend Lamar Jackson for what he did, but we I'm, like, I'm telling you what it was. Let me know what you think. The, the Baltimore Ravens should have definitely kicked the field goal. Well, we're being honest, the Baltimore Ravens should never have been in that situation because they was up. They was literally up by by three possessions, literally up by three possessions, and you end up screwing the game over because you have defensive issues. But again, you was put in a situation where you could have been you could have been up by three, and you could have put the pressure on the Buffalo Bills to actually go down the field. Okay, if they score a kick a field goal, you have another opportunity in overtime. If they score a touchdown, okay, you can go to the middle field and shake the hand and be like, "Good game," but you end up turning the ball over in the most crucial situation that you could possibly turn the ball over in. And now you're sitting at two and two and the Buffalo bills are sitting at three and one. Next game is the Washington football team. I watched the football team, Washington commanders, the Washington commanders at the Dallas Cowboys, NFC East. A rivalry game. Now, I, I I felt like this game was a little bit lopsided before I even watched it because of the fact that the Washington Commanders they were coming off of a game last week against the Philadelphia Eagles where they were unable to block the Philadelphia Eagles front four. Uh, Carson Wentz got sacked multiple times, and then we go into this game. Carson Wentz, I mean, well, the Dallas Cowboys defense up front was relentless. I felt like it was it was it was a no brainer pick, and again. It, 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 it's it's logical. Like it was a it was a no it was a no brainer pick. They they had no answer for the Dallas Cowboys front 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 where they couldn't get any where they couldn't protect Carson Wentz throughout the whole game. Carson Wentz didn't have a very good game. Threw for twenty five for forty two, one hundred seventy yards, one touchdown, and two interceptions. Um, a, a lot of disrupt. Really can't can't get the ball down the field. And we're going to hear about this in the future that uh, Terry McLaurin got locked up by um, by uh, Trayvon Diggs. Uh, but it, you got to give a lot of credit to the front four for the Dallas Cowboys. They literally they literally did their thing, and they are they are playing lights out right now at the at the defensive position at the, on the defensive side of the football right now for the Dallas Cowboys. Um, it's an excellent compliment to the actually compliment to the offense, which I feel like a lot of folks are going to be like, Oh, I think it's Cooper Rush's time. We're done with Dak Prescott. The offense looks completely different with, with Cooper Rush in the lineup. But if we're being honest, this looks exactly how the offense used to look when Dak was a rookie and probably the first two or three years into the league 
with the uh with the Dallas Cowboys where they were they were playing complimentary football they were playing complimentary football and they were relying heavily on the rushing attack with Ezekiel Elliott and they're doing the exact same thing they're not they're not putting the ball in Cooper Rush's hands too much they're limit, limiting his passing attempts today well Sunday and up throwing the ball 27 times through for 223 yards two touchdowns and didn't turn the ball over while Ezekiel Elliott well this game didn't exactly run the football quite effectively where he had 19 carries for 49 yards Tony Pollard didn't run the ball very well but they was able to consistently have the Washington Commanders come off the field on a consistent basis where they didn't have to uh where they didn't have to where they didn't have to uh, rely heavily on the running game which again the controversy of the whole Dak Prescott situation is going to come up but considering the fact that he's making over 180 million dollars which it takes over what 25 percent of your salary cap the ball's going to have to be in Dak Prescott's hands where you can't go back to that style of football uh, considering how you invested so much money into Dak so another win for the Dallas Cowboys and the Washington Commanders they got a lot of questions at the offensive line position. I wouldn't exactly go ahead and throw Carson Wentz under the bus yet because he made some some pretty some pretty good throws. Some throws that are a little bit late, but due to the offensive line not being able to protect for Carson, um, again, I'm going to go ahead and let this go for another week before we evaluate Carson on what we could possibly what they could possibly do moving forward. There's still a lot of football left to play uh, in this in this year's NFL season. <clears throat> now the Seattle Seahawks Seattle Seahawks at the Detroit Lions now before before this game I did have a, a couple of questions uh especially on the on the Detroit Lions offensive side of the ball where you didn't need, you didn't have Swift he was injured you had uh, Amon Ross St. Brown he was injured so where was the offense going to be coming from and Josh Reynolds has has stepped up for the Detroit Lions but uh, this is this is more looking at the Detroit Lions defensively, where they were just unable to stop the the Seattle Seahawks, um, allow them allowing them to score over forty eight points. Like I don't, I would have never have taken the over in in this game because of the fact that I was not that confident in Geno Smith, and Geno Smith was literally looking like that first round first round pick out of West Virginia, Geno Smith. Um, just the read options that he was running, he was able to break off big gains, um, big gains for the Seattle Seahawks and ran, had seven carries for 49 yards and a touchdown. And then Rashad Penny was able to go, go get, get off and get what he wanted. He ended up having over 151 yards rushing uh, for, uh, for the Seattle Seahawks. But it just seems like the Detroit Lions don't know what they want to run. They don't know if they want to run a three, four, they don't know if they want to run a four, three. And I just feel like they don't, they don't scheme correctly with their with their player personnel, what they have on their roster. Personally, they should just go ahead and just keep it at a four three, um, and they just need some bigger bodies right there in the middle. But uh, I'm not the coach. It's it's Dan Campbell. I've had my questions about Dan Campbell as far as a head coach, where I felt like at, there's going to be a time where the players are going to, to start to to tune out Dan Campbell's tough playing style. But the the, the biggest question mark for the Detroit Lions is definitely going to be the defense. Like I feel like um in 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 garbage time, Jared Goff does a lot for for the Detroit Lions, but they they could defensively that's the question. Is is it's, it's gonna come down to what what are you doing defensively uh for the Detroit Lions. Uh we have the next up is the Los Angeles Chargers and the Houston Texans where the Chargers ends up taking over the Texans thirty four to twenty four. Uh, unfortunately, I ended up taking the the Houston Texans. I thought they could possibly upset the Chargers, considering the question mark uh, with Keenan Allen and his health and, and Justin Herbert uh, with the ribs. That was a question. Uh, the Tennessee Titans and the Indianapolis Colts. The Titans take it twenty four seventeen. Uh, I I'm just not a believer in the Titans at this point. Like they don't have the weapons for them to be able to move the ball up and down the field. But they found a way to win against the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, the Giants taking it over the Chicago Bears, twenty to twelve. 
uh, the Philadelphia Eagles uh, get the win at home versus the Jacksonville Jaguars, where they ended up being in the hole, a two possession hole early, especially after the first the interception that the Jalen Hurts threw, where it ended up putting Jacksonville up by seven. Um, and then the New York Jets end up taking it over the Pittsburgh Steelers 24 to 20. And I wanted to, I wanted to put the microscope on to the Pittsburgh Steelers for a second, and it, it can't imagine how many uh, negative messages that I got over the post that I put on my Instagram story, as far as Mike Tomlin being an overrated coach. I've said this for the, for 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 a long period of time now, and it's 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 all good when you're winning. It's all good when you're winning. A lot of people want to talk about the the. Uh, the uh, the consecutive seasons, the consecutive seasons that Mike Tomlin has had a winning season, but they don't talk about the things what how how, how things ended up being the way that they are. And let's be real, he ended up inheriting inheriting a, a Super Bowl winning team with a with a with a with a remarkable defense like. I just just the, just the name off the top of my head, Troy Polamalu. We had a Troy Polamalu with a Dick LeBeau defense, which a Hall of Fame defensive coordinator in itself, in itself, and which elevated elevated Mike Tomlin. Which is not your fault; it's not his fault that he ended up inheriting such a great team. But what I've seen over the past several years, as far as what you bring to the table for the team has been a big, huge question mark for me. Like how you handled player situations, whether it be the Antonio Brown situation, whether it be the Le'Veon Bell situation, whether it be the Juju Smith-Schuster situation. Like there have been serious question marks with Mike Tomlin for me when I sit sit down and I'm look I'm I'm looking at it outside looking in, and I felt like there have been other coaches in the past. Yes, they haven't had the winning success, but they were able to do a lot more with less, and that's the and that's what we're in a situation now with with Mike Tomlin and the Pittsburgh Steelers. Now you you don't have Ben Roethlisberger. You don't have your your franchise quarterback anymore. You don't have all those Bill Cowher drafted defensive players anymore. I'm trying to sit here and I'm I'm thinking to myself, what defensive player has Mike Tomlin drafted since and that's had, that's have been have been success successful outside of TJ Watt. And don't bring up make a Fitzpatrick because the Dolphins drafted him and we traded him to y'all, the Pittsburgh Steelers. So outside of that, like what, what, what has Mike, Mike Tomlin, uh, it's, we'll see, we will see. But looking at this game, looking at this game in particular, Mike Tomlin decided to pull, uh, decided to pull Mitchell Trubisky for Kenny Pickett. In, in during the course of this game. And Kenny Pickett, I believe he threw three interceptions, if I'm not mistaken. Which 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 is to be expected. He's a he's a he's a rookie quarterback. We we're we're just throwing him in a situation. Um we don't know what we're gonna get out of it. Now, Kenny Pickett went 10 for 13, 120 yards, three interceptions. Which Trubisky didn't start the game off well, 7 for 13, 84 yards. Mike Tomlin stated in the press conference we needed a spark. He didn't exactly make a decision yet who's going to be the starting quarterback moving forward. But it, it's clear to me at this point, as you decide to pull Mitchell Trubisky, you, Kenny Pickett's the guy. Kenny, it, it's, it's Kenny, it's Kenny Pickett's time. Like You got nothing else to lose right now. And one of my biggest pet peeves about NFL coaches, head coaches, teams, where they throw they throw young quarterbacks, well, quarterbacks in general, behind offensive lines that can, cannot protect the quarterback. It really, it really, it really does not help the, de- the developmental part of a quarterback when you throw him in these type of situations. And I feel like at this point. You have no choice. You already threw. You already put Kenny Pickett in there. You re, like we've seen enough from Mitchell Trubisky, where it's like we know what we're going to get out of Mitchell Trubisky moving forward as a quarterback. I felt I felt like him his time in Buffalo, 
he could have learned a lot from the situation with uh, with, with Josh Allen and, and Brian Dayball as the offensive coordinator, both having a similar, him and Josh Allen having a similar playing style where they're able to be mobile with their legs and, 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 and make throw and throws on the run. And I'm not going to let the offensive coordinator off the hook either because I don't really like his play calling either. I feel like his play calling is very, very vanilla for, for Mitch Trubisky too as well, where he just like totally forgets that Mitch Trubisky is an athletic quarterback. He needs to be – moving around getting get gotten on the move but yeah I, I think moving forward it's going to be Kenny Pickett's job he won't like Tomlin won't make the decision right now but it's going to come to, I think it's going to come down maybe Wednesday Wednesday Thursday ish that he's going to make the decision where okay it's about it's 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 it's, it's go, we got it we got to go ahead and throw the young guy in there we got to go to the young guy in there at this point but uh, on the flip side, we're looking at the Jets. Zach Wilson, I uh, felt like he played a fairly decent game, 18 for 36, 252 yards, one touchdown, two interceptions. Now, this is Zach Wilson's first game back. Um, I wasn't expecting anything more from him, considering the fact this is, again, this is his first game. Um, they end up etching out a W against the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, so now we just looking at it. Like, we got a whole bunch of two and two teams. We got. Uh, Pitt, uh, Cincinnati. They're sitting at two and two. Which, if we're being honest, they should be. They should be three. Hold up, time out. Yeah, th- two and two. They're sitting at two and two. To be honest with you, they should be three and one because they shouldn't have lost to the Pittsburgh Steelers, unfortunately, to a technicality with the whole field goal blocking situation. Um, so really, the Steelers should be zero and three, zero and four. Excuse me, zero and four. So. Yeah, y'all, y'all Pittsburgh Steelers can sit there. And y'all can jump down my throat all you want, and I know a lot of people will be like, "Man, you, you got to support your black coaches." But yeah, you do. But at the end of the day, let's let's call it a spade a spade. Mike Tomlin is an overrated coach, in my honest opinion. Now, if I'm now if somehow he's able to turn this thing around and he could somehow get the Steelers out the basement right now, and and possibly you know coach up something where they can end up being. T- I don't know, like 500 somehow. Like, okay, I'll give credit where credit is due. But until that time, we're going to continue to talk about this uh, moving forward. Um, so next up, we have the Arizona Cardinals. They end up taking the dub versus the Carolina Panthers 26-16. Um, another good game was the New England Patriots. New England Patriots versus the Green Bay Packers. The Green Patriots versus the Green, uh, Green Bay Packers, where I felt like this game it should have been a clear runaway, but unfortunately it did end up being that way. Now at the beginning, uh, again it was a clear runaway. Brian Hoyer ended up getting hurt, and I'm like, oh yeah, the Packers got this in the bag. There's no way. So the new the the, the rookie quarterback uh, Bailey Zapp comes in. Um, didn't play he did enough for what to expect from a seventh round rookie quarterback uh where he ended up throwing for 10 for 15 10 was 10 for 15 99 yards and one touchdown um the new england patriots kept this game fairly close uh throughout throughout the game uh what they were what they were trying to do was come out in a lot of man-to-man and, and and take away the lot of a lot of stuff underneath because the receivers they're not very good. The Green Bay Packers receivers were not very good at uh, uh, getting off of press coverage, getting separation, and it was causing a little bit of an issue for Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers. But the Green Bay Packers were, were able to overcome that, and Aaron Rodgers like. Uh, you know what the you know what the you know what the beef was with Aaron Rodgers. Now that he doesn't have Devontae Adams, there's going to be an excuse as why the Green Bay Packers are not going to possibly be contenders in the NFC. And how many receivers did he throw the ball to? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven guys got involved yesterday versus the New England Patriots. Alan Lazar was the leading receiver with six catches, 116 yards. Um Romeo Dobbs, I felt like he's 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 going to be on the rise to being the guy at some point. He's still young. He's still he's still trying to find his way. But I wanted to key in on a particular play at the end of the game in the fourth quarter. Aaron Rodgers like, yo, we going for the gusto. Be ready, Romeo. So 
it was a deep bomb to Romeo Dobbs and against the New England Bet- Patriots best corner, Jonathan, Jonathan Jones. Romeo Dobbs calls the ball in and unfortunately he ends up making contact with the ground and the ball ends up rolling out and that would have been the ball game. Now, the game ended up going into overtime. The, the New England Patriots end up losing to the to the Green Bay Packers because they were unable to move the ball with their with their young inexperienced quarterback and, and and Bailey Zapp. But I felt like the New England Patriots defensively did a phenomenal job versus the Green Bay Packers, where they were able to put their put put get Green Bay off the field fair, fairly easily by. But disrupting the time of the wide receivers and putting pressure on Aaron Rodgers, but it's 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 it's, it's tough to overcome that when you don't have a, a a good quality quarterback as a starter um, for for the New England Patriots. So the New England Patriots are now sitting at one and three, last in the AFC East. Would they be I'm not even used to saying that out of my mouth? Last in the AFC East, and the Green Bay Packers are still currently sitting in the first place. And I feel like this was a big win for the Packers. And I want to go back to what I said two weeks ago. As far as the Green Bay Packers, their offense is 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 going to have to go through the two running backs and AJ Dillon and, and Aaron Jones. Uh, Aaron Jones was what six had sixteen carries, one hundred and ten yards. AJ Dillon had seventeen carries for seventy three yards. I wish they wouldn't be so AJ Dillon dependent. I'm not saying that for the fa- for the sake of my fantasy team, but I feel like Aaron Jones is a little bit more effective. He be like that. He is considering how he's a smaller back, he. With contact, he 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 gets he gets more yards off of contact, and I feel like by them just rotating into two, sometimes they go two back sets. I feel like Aaron Jones is 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 unable to get to his full potential because of the fact that he's sharing carries with AJ Dillon. But again, the Green Bay Packers walked away with the victory. Like, also, I was about to I was about to dismiss this whole situation. Aaron Rodgers threw his 500th touchdown pass yesterday versus the New England Patriots. Only have a handful of quarterbacks have ever done that, and it's a big, huge honor for Aaron Rodgers for him to be put in that conversation of the 500 touchdown club. Shout out to the haters, by the way. Shout out to the haters. Shout out to the haters. Uh, what's what game we have next? Bear with me here. Computer is uh. Moving a little bit slower than usual, but uh, I, I, before before we even jump into that, I wanted to go ahead and point out like, like man, get with the, the fantasy team. When you, I I I just can't stand. I can't stand backs that take split carries. That's just my biggest pet peeve because you you never know who's got the hot hand. Like it just gets it just gets ridiculous, honestly. So the Denver Broncos ended up taking it over the Las Vegas Raiders. No, excuse me. The Vegas Raiders took it over the Broncos, thirty-two to twenty-three. Um. Oh, that was the last game. Excuse me. So we got last but not least, we have the Monday Night Football game, which is going to be tonight. Um. I want to bring up the spread. Yeah, I want to bring up the spread for this game. So it's going to the spread is going to be. All right, the spread is going to be two points. So it changed from yesterday. It went from one and a half to two points. So now it's two points. Uh, the over-under is 42 and a half. Um, honestly, I think I'm going to go ahead and go with the San Francisco 49ers. I don't know uh, the situation with, with Matthew Stafford and that throwing shoulder is a big concern for me. Um, I'm not really sold on it. And I just like I just like the way that I just like the way that uh, Kyle Shanahan is able to draw up plays schematically for the Los Angeles Rams. They always play each other tough. They always play each other extremely tough. Like the defense, the defensively, they're they're fairly close. Um, 13th in the league for the for the San Francisco 49ers. 19th in the league for the Los Angeles Rams. Um, but I just I'm just I just feel like they're just going. The 49ers are just better running the football than the Los Angeles Rams. So I'm going to go ahead and take the Los Angeles, excuse me, the San Francisco 49ers. I'm going to go ahead and money line in the night. And this game is going to be at 8.15 uh, Eastern time. But, uh, 
Yeah. Oh, I don't even want to give you. An, I don't even want to tell you when the next time we're gonna be go live. Just just look out for the bad signal for the next time. Uh, but this is the Not for the Bay podcast. Uh, I'm up out of here, man. Nah, nah, nah for the bay. Nah, nah for the bay. Nah, we don't care what you say. Nah for the bay. Nah, nah, nah for the bay. Nah, nah for the bay. Nah, we don't care what you say. Nah for the bay. Fire.